How are you, Counselor? I'm fine. I'm going to run through a whole set of questions with regards to family court division. As you know, I received child support and I continue to push to see a higher collection rate. Currently, you're at 70% and I would like to see 100%. What strategies are you looking at over the past four years? I know you've gotten this question before. Additionally, with raise the age now coming to you, I've seen your diversion rate go down since the previous administration from 85% in your first year to 81% currently. Uh, how can you divert more kids and keep them out of the juvenile justice system? That's one piece. Another place where we've had a lot of conversations is judgment and claims, uh, whether or not you have a more prominent role in setting judgment and claims and, and how that number is come to. Uh, prior to this administration, the average was $584 million. Uh, in the last fiscal year, it seemed to increase by about $80 million. Uh, you've got that uh, behind you. And uh, I think the concern is that it keeps creeping up. Uh, at this point, it looks like you're projecting a 16 to $18 million increase in the, all the out years, which would come out to about a 10% increase as we're investing in attorneys and, and you are my attorney and we're hiring more people we're doing vertical case handling and I believe you're winning more cases that's pretty impressive but um, if all of that is happening I don't know why we're planning to pay out more so would like uh, you to adjust those numbers down and comment on that uh, similarly just to follow up on uh, my colleague Mr. Yeager uh, just the raise the age and how that's going to impact us Additionally, a source of funds is uh, the, all, all the Environmental Control Board debt, which you're responsible for collecting. We did an amnesty program. What is the law department's role in uh, making sure that that money gets collected so that we sp the money we spend actually comes back to us? Uh, and any interaction with Local Law 47 that asks agencies to check each other's outstanding judgment, uh, sorry, outstanding ECB debt before they give things, and I think last but not least, uh, I would like to know how much the law department is spending to stop the city council from signing on to lawsuits, uh, and whether or not you believe that city employees shouldn't sue the city uh, and shouldn't be on amicus briefs, uh, because as a, a city council member, I am encouraging as many whistleblowers as possible to step up to the plate and take whatever means necessary, whether it's standing up to sexual harassment and filing claims in court uh, or anywhere, because we want a city where our employees uh, are standing up and doing their best to fix what's broken. Okay. Uh, that's quite a few questions. I'll try to handle uh, the, in the, them in the order that I, uh, that I remember hearing them. And, the, and let me uh, start with uh, family court diversion, because uh, I know it's, it's, it's a topic in which you're interested. And I think that um, there are times when, um, when numbers uh, tell a story that's counterintuitive. Um, actually, as uh, the, the, uh, the slight reduction um, uh, in the number of cases diverted is part of a good story. And that is that there are fewer cases coming into the system that are worthy of diversion than in prior years because there are some, there are times uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a part of an overall um, effort and conscious effort on the part of city law enforcement uh, to um, not address as, uh, as criminal behavior, uh, things that have been addressed as, as, as crimes in the past. Uh, and this um, effort toward uh, kind of a practical decriminalization of conduct results in very trivial cases not coming into the system in the first place. And if they don't come into the system, uh, uh, they're not cases to be diverted. Uh, the primary responsibility for diversion rests not with the, uh, the law department, uh, family court division, but with the probation department. They're the people who, um, at the earliest point of intake, make decisions about whether or not cases should be diverted. After those cases that pass the probation screen come to the law department, there's an additional screening process to see if there are uh, further uh, uh, diversion-worthy cases that can be squeezed 
out of the system, and we uh, conscientiously do that as well. I think that the 81% figure sounds about right for the kinds, for, as a percentage of the cases that come into the system. Uh, thank you for the pause so I can just interpose. Sure. Uh, would you consider changing the PMMR and MMR indicator to more accurately affect the information that you're sharing? And similarly, would you share with me and this committee the numbers that you're talking about historically from 2014 to now, the number of prosecutions, the types of cases, whether C, B, or A misdemeanors or felonies, and uh, I would love a breakdown on the types of cases that are being deferred, and then I guess I would just push back that in this situation, the family court, the law department is stepping in and as the prosecutor, as, as in, in the executive function here, and so I feel that the whether it's the district attorney uh, or prosecutor or what have you, you have the most discretion as the case goes in terms of what you're seeking and whether or not to move forward with the case, so. Well, I, I don't disagree with that at all, but, the, but if you apply that discretion to a base of cases that is changing, mm -hmm. and that is where thoughtful decisions are being made about these cases before we get them, so that we get a more serious uh, class of cases in the first place that are less diversion worthy, then there are going to be fewer cases to divert. But, but in answer and to your, share your request for, inf uh, for information, I think, is quite apt. I think that if we can provide you more granular information about how we make these decisions, that I think there will be a better understanding of, of, of how uh, and, uh, and why these, these uh, percentages are what they are. Thank you. Um, with respect to um, judgment and claims. Well, actually, I was actually I was going uh, uh, next uh, in in order to um, uh, uh, child interstate uh, to child and child support, um, but our child support program is a national reciprocal program that is a fail safe uh, for all those jurisdictions, including our own, that are not successful in holding uh, uh, parents responsible for paying uh, child support claims who move. Uh, outside of the boundaries of whatever court had jurisdiction uh, of the case in the first place. It is a fail-safe measure, and as such, uh, to be blunt, I don't expect uh, that we're going to be 100% effective because at, um, if you look at the challenges of asserting jurisdiction and recovering uh, child support monies due in a case that's within our jurisdiction, those issues are compounded when you're talking about a case from someone else's jurisdiction. So we will always try to maximize uh, those recoveries. I believe that 100%, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, might be a, an unrealistic target. Uh, something, short, uh, something short of that as a stretch target is, is something that I think the, that, uh, that uh, um, uh, is something that we can, we can consider. 70% um, is not a um, inappropriate uh, level of, uh, of recovery in, in, uh, in my experience. But we, get, we, we will always strive to do better. Just to push back on that, so you have the Uniform Interstate Family Support Act, UIFSA, which theoretically should be making the interstate uh, commerce situations and jurisdictional issues a lot easier. Is there necessity for advocacy by law department or the city on the federal level and by the mayor's office who does advocacy there uh, or even by the National Conference of Mayors to change UIFSA and, and make an amendment so that we can it, get folks even when they leave the jurisdiction? It's not, it's, it's not an issue of inadequacy of law. It is just the reality of practice across state boundaries. Uh, where you have to, in order to enforce these judgments, you have to receive adequate paperwork from the sending jurisdiction. And in the same way that there are clerical errors made in any kind of complicated uh, uh, transaction, those happen frequently uh, in these cases. And so in order, to, in order to enforce a judgment here from a distant jurisdiction, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 we have to make sure that all the paperwork that supports that judgment 
uh, being levied upon uh, a, a parent that hasn't fulfilled their responsibility is in order, and, it, and that's just not always the case. There, there, there's going to be some fall off. And that's, and that's not, a, and, and it's not an issue of, of changing the law. People have to, in every clerk's office, in every court from around the country, including our own from time to time, these things happen. Uh, that, that is, uh, all of those things add up to it not being a system that is going to be, that is going to provide a perfect basis for us to enforce in every single case. Would you be, so, so that having insufficiency of long arm jurisdiction or, or other parts uh, would I actually be a more favorable answer, but like the answer of there's clerical or pro due process issues is a little more manageable and my hope is that you would consider digging into it and perhaps even producing just a report internally that you might share with us of, of the number of cases of those 30%. How many of them, because something wasn't certified and wasn't stamped by the right notary and it was a stamp but it wasn't a sealed stamp or it's not the original and you need the original but you don't, like just breaking down the different process errors and then breaking it down by the 49 different jurisdictions that we're hearing from so that we can get a sense of what the problems are and then perhaps even proactively work with other jurisdictions where, and, and we could even start at the top ones. I'm guessing New Jersey and Connecticut uh, and Pennsylvania, which are very close states, are where we probably have the most relationships where we could work with them and have a multi-jurisdictional group to get to the bottom of the problems and you get uh, the city clerk with uh, the, the other clerk and get them together to work with that. When I was an attorney, I worked with New York County Lawyers Association. We worked with the federal district courts, the clerks of every single one on reforming the electronic case filing system, ECF, and I, I think something like that could help and get us to a, a higher number. Fundamental problem of um, enforcing judgments against mobile parents is the fact that they are mobile. Verifying last known addresses is the most difficult single challenge. And that is, by its nature, imperfect. Again, doesn't require a change in law. Uh, people work very conscientiously to try to track down parents who are moving around from job to job and location uh, to location. Uh, and we'll always endeavor to, uh, to do a better job. Uh, but uh, I think that the changes in, in law alone um, are not gonna get that done. This, this, these are very difficult circumstances. Uh, if, if we can continue offline, if we continue to raise the age and the other questions. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much, Councilman uh, Perkins. So, sorry, just hoping to get an answer on, uh, at least at a very minimum, just the uh, representation of uh, whether- On judgment and claims? No, no, with regards to the, the council, many of us have filed on as amicus on a uh, lawsuit relating to real estate taxes in the city and inequity there. And my understanding is a motion has been filed by the law department uh, relating to whether or not council members may sign on as amicus and, and broadly whether or not we may sue the city uh, as city employees. And so wanted to know how much is being spent on that and if that is something that has risen to your level and uh, whether or not city employees should be allowed to bring cases against the city for systemic reforms. Well. The issue is what entity has the right to represent the city in litigation? And what entity before the court has the right to assert what the official position is of the city in litigation? The law department has always welcomed alternative voices to participate in litigation. Whether they are from the city council, individual members, or groups of members of the city council who may have an alternative view of um, the interpretation of a local law, um, or have some other view um, 
on a matter in litigation. So long as it's understood that those other voices do not represent the official position of the city. We welcome those alternative voices and, though, and, they, and we have not opposed uh, the participation of council persons or other advocates um, on the issue you raised or other issues, uh, so long as their role uh, is clearly understood by the court as not representing the official position of the city. But we believe that uh, the court's ultimate decision is always going to be best informed uh, when there are a multiplicity of voices, as long as there's no conclusion about who represents the official position of the city. So we will, we will never stand in the way of individual council members uh, having their voices heard. Okay, so, so just to be clear, I can take a position as council member Ben Kalos in my official capacity as an elected official representing myself and my district, and uh, I can sue, I can be amicus, that is fine so long as I do not represent that as the voice of the entire council as a body or as the voice of the city of New York. Well, the, you can make an application to the court to be heard as a non-party. It's up to the court to determine whether or not you will be heard because there does come a point where multiple voices become a cacophony. And having served as a, as a judge of both the state and federal courts, I know that there is going to be, there's, a, there's productive uh, participation from multiple voices and then there's then there are more voices than are necessary to help a judge reach a reasonable decision. So that, that ultimately, how many non-parties are going to be permitted to be heard in litigation is ultimately going to be up to a judge on a case-by-case -case basis. I, I appreciate it as long, and are you, sp so in terms of the motion that we're talking about, what was the cost of that, and is that just being withdrawn, or was that, could that be handled through a letter through chambers and just resolved without spending however much money? I'm not in a position to, to answer that question right now without conferring with my staff. And you'll pass on how much has been spent on that motion in particular? Well, first of all, we don't, we're not a private law firm. We don't bill, and so we, we, I, it, I can't calculate with precision uh, how much, uh, I can tell you how many people may be assigned to a particular case, but not how much it costs. That would be helpful. We don't bill. And uh, the, the committee staff will forward the remainder of the questions, and if you can respond to those in writing to myself and the committee, thank you. Right. I mean, a lot less money would be spent if the council members who wanted to participate would follow our suggestion and had from the outset at participating in a way that doesn't conflict or interfere with the law department's primary role in representing the city's interest before the courts. We've made suggestions, we have told the council and its representatives that we welcome their participation but it has to be done in an orderly way, consistent with how the law orderly develops and is, is litigated before the courts. I, I've never received such communication. Uh, you should need to talk to your staff. Would, would you, if you could send it to me directly. Certainly. And if, if it's okay, if I can share that communication publicly for anyone who reaches out. Thank you. Thank you so much.